Hello and welcome to another episode of Cup of Science, the online show that is taking the science from your pint and placing it perfectly in your favorite mug. I am your host, Phil Bell Young, and in tonight's show, we're taking a page out of Elon Musk's book and launching into space with Professor Brad Gibson to find out everything we know about space today that we didn't know last year. Hopefully, we'll get it right the first time. Plus, our halftime act. Uh, last week, I was set a science demonstration challenge that will be happening during our halftime here in my kitchen. Stay tuned. It's going to be extraordinary. <laughs> and um, we'll be finishing off tonight, as always, with questions and answers from you, our wonderful audience. Anyway, before any of that, I uh, just once again want to say a massive welcome to everyone who is tuning in tonight. Please let us know what you're doing, where you're watching us from, what you're drinking, what biscuits you've got, anything and everything. You can do this uh, by commenting in the comment section below this video, and we can display it on screen like this. Or, well, or you can also tweet us using hashtag Cup of Science. Uh, can we bring that? Yeah, so you can, if you, <laughs> if you comment under the video, you get them, uh, we'll pop it up on screen like that. Uh, if you tweet us, you can tweet us using hashtag Cup of Science or, of course, at Pint of Science or at Philby91. Um, so just before we continue tonight, we're actually going to tune in to see uh, what biscuits we're having tonight with our biscuit correspondence. This is a new segment of the show, so you might need to give it some time. Bailey's the bunny. What biscuits have we got? Bailey's the bunny. Biscoff. Lotus, Lotus Biscoff. Right. What, a, what, what an acquired taste. Uh, that bunny has, or maybe, maybe it's just me. Hashtag bring your own biscuits. Anyway, it is time to get started. So our speaker tonight is the head of department for physics and maths at the University of Hull, as well as the director of the EA Milne Center for Astrophysics. His research has included using explo exploding stars to determine the expansion rate of the universe with the Hubble Space Telescope. But it's not just his research that's astronomical, but his school's outreach and public engagement work as well, which has earned him many accolades, one of which is the named uh, is being named by the Institute of Physics for the John Porter Memorial Lecturer. So please raise your mug for Professor Brad Gibson. <laughs> Thanks very much, Phil. I appreciate it. I've lost all sound. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I've now lost you. Uh, I'm not sure if I've been muted on your side or not, Phil. Can you hear me? Because I've lost all sound on my side. Okay. Oh. If I get a, a comment coming through the chat saying you can hear me, then I will. I will we can hear you perfectly, Brad. Sorry about that. We're, we're now live with you. We can hear oh. you perfectly. Fine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Am I, am I okay to go? Yep. Yep. Okay. Sure. Yep. Yeah, we're doing it. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. I really appreciate, really appreciate the opportunity. And. Um, and I sat down a couple of days ago thinking about what is it that I want to actually get across within 15 minutes. Um, I'm looking at, at how many papers have actually been published in my field of space science in the last 12 months, and it's up to 450,000. I'm trying to wade through 450,000 papers and sort of pick out the four biggest highlights. So it literally is sort of filtering through it to get that one in 100,000 results from the last year that sort of tipped my fancy. You may have things that I thought your fancy during that period of time that don't agree with mine, in which case, they go to the end and check in with questions of the things that, that interest you. Like I say, these are just a few of the things that actually interest uh, you. So, what I'm going to start with here are the four things I want to cover, and I'll slip something in right at the end, which is a bit of self serving uh, advertising. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, incredibly, insanely energetic radiation that's bombarding the planet Earth at all times. Now, when you hear the word radiation, typically you start to think bad things. Um, 
And if you go back a couple of weeks, uh, when Isabel Perez was talking about Hulk and cancer, you may have a different picture of, in your mind of what radiation means. But radiation spans a wide range of, of energies. And the important thing I want you to take uh, is that we're being bombarded in, with all kinds of energies uh, from different photons, from different sources all the time. From the sun, we've got you know, a yellow photon that has an energy of what we call one electron volt. Details don't matter, but just keep that in mind as sort of a reference, one electron volt. If you move over to sort of low energy radiation, like radio waves, they typically have an energy maybe one billionth that of a yellow photon from the sun. Microwaves, maybe one millionth uh, that of the energy of a yellow photon from the sun. You can move over to higher energies, ultraviolet photons, they may be 10 to 100 times more energetic than a yellow photon from the sun. X-rays, maybe several thousand, 10,000 times the energy. You can move up into gamma rays, and you're up into the range of millions and ten, tens of millions of times more energetic than that individual photon that comes from the sun in the, in the yellow band. But that really is just a sort of drop in the bucket compared to the sort of energies that are hitting us from outside of our solar system. So what you see on your screen there is a simulation of an exploding star. And once every decade in our Milky Way galaxy, a star heavier than maybe 10 times that of the sun explodes, dumps an enormous amount of energy. More importantly, everything that you can look around where you're sitting in your room came from a star like this, uh, billions upon billions of years ago. All of the chemical elements around us that we're made of came from those sorts of exploding stars. Now what's left at the center of that exploding star, the remnant, it's called a neutron star. It's a really compact ball of fundamental particles called neutrons. And if they are spinning around, we call them pulsars. It's kind of like a lighthouse effect. And every once in a while, the jet coming out of this spinning neutron star sweeps across us, like you can see in this animation in the bottom right. And again, it's like a lighthouse beacon going off. And we this is, allows us to discover uh, these remnants of exploding stars that have exploded a long time ago. Um, these pulsars are unique in the sense that as that jet sweeps through the material that surrounds the remnant, it dumps a lot of energy into the electrons that are surrounding it, which increases the energy of the electrons. It starts to boil them in some sense. And while there's electrons there, there's also photons, there's light, there's radiation, there's energy. And those photons get jostled by those excited electrons. And you can scatter the energy of the photons from sort of the typical photon energy of that of the sun, that one electron volt, up trillions of times, hundreds of trillion times more energetic than those sorts of, um, uh, those sorts of photons. And it's the unique way that we can actually probe the most extreme objects that are easy for us to study in our galaxy, neutron stars. It also allows us to study everything along this long line of sight between us and that lighthouse as it sweeps over top of us. And if I go back about 15 years ago, this point way down the bottom right here along this axis of the plot is energy. Way over here is the energies that we talked about before, X-rays and, and gamma rays. But if I move further and further and further over here, I increase the energy and this down in here is a photon that was received at Earth from this remnant of an exploding star called the Crab Nebula. And it has an energy about 80 trillion times that of the typical photon that comes from the sun. So that was the, the record holder uh, up until this year when Aminomori et al, uh, Chinese uh, collaboration, a uh, large collaboration made use of this facility that you can see here is high up in the Tibetan mountains. It's uh, about a thousand uh, elements that are spread over about 10 acres. And what they do is they look up at the sky and they look for what's called an air shower. As high energy photons come from things like exploding stars, they hit our atmosphere and they create particles that come raining down on top of this array. And it allows us to measure as we move over to the right of this plot, way over here to this red point, this is now the world record holder of the most energetic radiation that has ever hit us. It has an energy 350 trillion times that yellow photon that comes from the sun. These things, like I say, these are the most perfect probes for studying extreme physics of these compact objects that are left over after stars explode. 
Um, and more importantly, at least from my perspective, it allows us to study everything that photon sees between the object that exploded and where we sit today. It's a beautiful probe of everything that passes through along the way. So that's a fantastic new result. Uh, if I stay with the radio, uh, radio waves, um, this was a really fun one. I guess you would call this is one of the, the biggest mysteries right now in all of astronomy. It's things called fast radio bursts. These are what they sound like. They're short, roughly one one thousandth of a second or less. Incredibly intense bursts of radio emission. Not really high energy photons, but low energy photons. But incredibly intense, incredibly short bursts. They occur all over the sky. They have an unknown origin. We've only, like I say, we've only known about them for about 13 years. And much like the case for the, the high energy photons that come from uh, neutron stars and pulsars that I just talked about, these are also really invaluable probes of what's going on around whatever the source is of these fast radio bursts. It allows us to explore the medium that exists around them. Even if we don't know exactly what the origin of these things are, we can at least study what's going on around them. We use a technique called polarimetry, much like your Polaroid glasses that you may use uh, to uh, reduce the glare when you're driving, for example. Uh, you can use polarimetry to sort of filter through a noisy background to lock on particular uh, light waves that you want to focus on. We'll come back to that in uh, just a minute. When they first, up until, for about 10 years after the first discovery, up to about 2017 or so, uh, there were a lot of claims out there, uh, some from, from legitimate scientists um, who suggested that maybe these things are so weird, they're so extreme, we have no idea what they are. Maybe they, we are seeing, you know, signature of alien, uh, advanced alien civilization, including the sort of uh, drawing that you see right here, which is suggested of a powerful light sail being blasted with a radio beam from some advanced civilization, accelerating this light sail up to the high speeds. And every once in a while, you get radio leakage away from the light sail. And that would be sort of the, uh, the signature that you're seeing in these fast radio bursts. Now, it's a cute idea, uh, very difficult to prove. And what has happened over the last 12 to 18 months is that we've now actually traced where these things are actually coming from, these fast radio bursts. We don't have a perfect idea of what they are yet, but we know exactly where they're coming from. Uh, this is a very new result from Bannister and collaborators late in 2019, look, who discovered one of these fast radio bursts. And this is just a burst of radio emission. And this is time along the horizontal axis. And what you're seeing is just a very brief sort of one one thousandth of a second burst of that radio emission that shows you that there was a fast radio burst. And this particular experiment, they were able to tell exactly where in the sky it came from, and they were able to trace it to a particular galaxy, very distant galaxy. And so it tells us that something about the environment in which these fast radio bursts come from, because we can now trace them to their host galaxies. Now, what's actually causing the fast radio burst? Is it sort of emerging neutron stars? Is it something to do with things merging with black holes? This is still the 64,000 pound question, uh, and it's still one, like you say, one of the biggest unanswered questions in astronomy. Now, we can go just, just back a few weeks ago, and a big piece of the puzzle came in. Uh, this, the paper has not actually been published. It was just an announcement that was put out as an astronomy telegram rather than a full paper but a, a group out of the University of Toronto as part of a collaboration called CHIME is actually the first group to actually discover one of these fast radio bursts inside of the Milky Way galaxy. So it's inside of our galaxy. It's not a distant one on the other side of the universe. And it's the first one and the only one that we know about that is that close to us. Now it's not quite as energetic as the ones that I just talked about. It's on the low end of that energy spectrum, but it is still technically what we would call a fast radio burst. But because it is so close, we can actually go out and we can find the object that's actually responsible for this one particular fast radio burst. And it's associated with, now you can see the, the postal code of this object here. It's not particularly romantic. It's what we call a magnetar. It is a neutron star, a remnant of an exploding star with an incredibly, incredibly intense magnetic field and a really thick, thick iron crust on top of it. And what we think is happening with this magnetar is that every once in a while, this thick, um, iron crust, which is about 10 billion times stronger than steel, it cracks. And when it does that little crack, it gives off this burst of intense radio emission for a very short period of time. That seems to be with consist consistent with the models. 
Whether every fast radio burst is like this, we don't know, but this is the first one we've really been able to pin down. And it's so new that there isn't even a paper that I can show you. It's only just uh, come out about a month ago. So very exciting development. Uh, the other thing that really caught my attention is sort of outside of my field is this is the year where we finally witnessed planets actually being formed in real time. Now, observing planets, we know four or 5,000 extrasolar planets now, so they're very common in that sense. We can infer their, their mass, how close they are to their stars. We know lots about them. Uh, but it's been really tricky to actually image these planets. Why is that? Well, because the star is so bright and the planet is so faint that it's very difficult to see it in the glare of the star. And those planets are just butted up so close, relatively speaking, to those stars that it's incredibly difficult to actually get an image of a planet and even more difficult if you like to get an image of a planet as it is starting to form before it's actually formed. Now, you can uh, go back maybe five years ago or so was the first time that we got really clear evidence of um, the formation of planets. Now, here's a kind of an angled picture of what's called a protoplanetary disk. It's a disk of gas and dust around a star called HL Tau. And what you can see are those nice little dark rings there. Even though you can't see a planet, there's a planet inside each of those rings that's been going around the ring, hoovering up material. So this planetary system is in you know, the process of forming, but, and we can see the evidence of it forming in that picture, but we can't actually see that planet itself. But that was an amazing step, and that's only five years ago that we started to get pictures like that. Um, it was only about 18 months ago that we actually got the first image of a newly born planet. This uh, bright blob here and this dark spot in the middle, it's called a coronagraph. Basically, it just blocks out the light of the star, which would otherwise overwhelm things. And that little blob that you see there is a picture of a really newly born planet, not a well-established one like the planets in our solar system, but one that has just very recently formed. But that still isn't the same as catching one in the actual formation uh, process. And that is really tricky. Now that has changed just over the last few months, uh, thanks to this amazing facility, uh, the European Southern Observatory and the very large telescope, the VLT, uh, sits in the, in the desert in Chile and Paranal. And this is one of the eight meter class telescopes and whoops, got a bit carried away there. Let's pop on back, hopefully. Let's go back. What I want to show you is this gigantic thing here is if you like sort of the, the camera, but it's a gigantic camera. It's, it's the size of a very large lorry and it's called a spectrograph. It's called sphere. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to take beautiful images, but it also allows you to do the same thing I just mentioned a second ago, polarimetry. Again, similar to putting on Polaroid lenses and blocking out some of the, the, the haze of scattered light that allows you to see further. You can use polarimetry to do the exact same thing when you're studying dusty objects uh, and blurry objects in elsewhere in the universe. You use polarimetry and that allows you to filter through some of the light and take out different linear and what we call circular polarizations. It gives you a crisper view on very small angular scales. And this is what we've seen. The pub paper has just been published now. And what we're seeing up in the, the left here is a, an image in the infrared and it's been filtered a little bit to make it look a little bit nicer. And you see these spiral features, which are typical of a system in just beginning to start forming planets. And you're able to zoom in and see this blue area here, and you can also see it on this side here. And what you're seeing is the interaction of um, spiral gas and dust waves. And what that twisted blue thing is, is a planet in the process of forming. It's not newly formed. It's not a disk that is, hasn't begun forming at all. This is the first snapshot we have of any planetary system where the planet is it, right in the beginning throes of actual formation. That little twist is this clear signature of a planet that's accreting material from around it. Best guess is it'll be something that's five or 10 times the mass of Jupiter. It's at a distance about 30, um, 30 astronomical units, so the equivalent of, say, Neptune in our, in our solar system. Brand new, only a few months ago, this is the first picture of a protoplanet really in the formation phase, the earliest formation phase. Last one I want to end on, I'm not going to say a whole lot on it because it got so much attention over the last year. It completely dominated uh, astrophysical media in, in some sense. Um, it is probably the space image of the year, possibly the state space image of the decade. 
When you look at it on the left, this is the actual astronomical image from the Event Horizon Telescope. This is a image of a black hole, if you like. Um, it's a black, supermassive black hole, six or seven billion times the mass of the sun at the center of an elliptical galaxy called M87, far, far away from us. And what you're actually seeing right there is this photon ring, uh, which is basically as close as you can get before uh, the escape velocity of the black, you know, when you cross the event horizon, if you like, uh, the escape velocity goes greater than the speed of light. And so there is a ring very close to the event horizon where photons get trapped in orbit and go racing around the black hole. If they fall inside of that, inside the event horizon, they're trapped forever because that's just how black holes work. Uh, but what you can see, that that sort of dark area in the middle, that donut bit right there, that is the what we call the shadow of the black hole. It is the sort of what we call the gravitational lens um, event horizon. Now it's a little bit brighter than in the center than it is way out here because there is surrounding material all around this black hole. But what you're seeing right there is the edge of this gravitationally lensed part of the event horizon. It's a first successful probe of gravity on these sorts of scales uh, that's never been accessible previously. Einstein's theories still hold up the test of time. Um, and we can infer a very precise mass of the, the supermassive black hole, like the 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. And it's a rotating black hole, which we can tell from the models. And down in the bottom right is a the best guess model as to what it would look like. And all of those lines that you see are photons that are sort of circling around uh, held on by the very extreme gravitational field of, of the black hole. Uh, it's an incredible result. We don't have much in the way of statistic yet. It's just one single object. How many black holes are rotating? How many are not? How many are charged? How many are not? This is what the next five, 10 years where we start to build up statistics. But this is the first successful image, if you like, of a, of a black hole. And so the last thing I want to say is just one slide because it just was released uh, today. Uh, this is a an experiment called the Horizon Run 5. It is in some ways probably the most ambitious computational simulation ever undertaken, perhaps in astrophysical sciences, uh, certainly, possibly everywhere. Uh, this is about 300 million core hours or the equivalent of 30,000 core years, um, running an enormous cosmological volume, which is what you sort of see here, the large scale structure of the universe. But inside of that, inside of every single white dot in there, we keep track of how stars form and evolve, what happens when they die, where does the energy go, where do the chemical elements that get synthesized go, where do they show up, how do they get incorporated into next generations of stars. And the reason why I put it out there, because it is one of the most ambitious computational uh, experiments ever undertaken. And if you look at this link up here, if you want to follow it, um, it just came out at 12.01 at midnight uh, tonight. So you can look at the uh, the paper in, in real time as the rest of the astronomical community is, and it's going to be driving our research for the next sort of three, four or five years or so, data mining this enormous, enormous data set. So I'll just wrap up with uh, the things that tickled my fancy over the last year. And like I say, may not um, uh, overlap with yours, in which case, uh, let's have a little chat and see what tickled your fancy. And I'll give you my thoughts on them. And thanks for listening, folks. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Brad, for that. Remember, uh, we are going to be taking a bit of a break now. So if you do have any questions about space that you want to ask, Professor Brad Gibson, you can do so by commenting beneath this video uh, in the comment section, and we'll be displaying it on screen. And we're doing a Q and answer, a questions and answer segment in about five minutes or so. So we're going to say bye for now, Brad. Bye for now. <laughs> we'll have you back in a second. Just before we move on, though, uh, we have had a few comments on YouTube already. So let's let's pick a few. We've had a oh, so we've got Sonia who is having chocolate chip cookies tonight, which. Uh, it's great. It's one of my favorite biscuits. Uh, Leslie says, hello from Edinburgh. Hello from Edinburgh. Uh, well, hello from Hull. Oh, Edinburgh would be a, a lovely place to be with the castle and everything tonight. Um, what else we got? We got someone, uh, stew PG tips with chocolate digestive chaser or two or the whole packet. Uh, let's face it, they're that delicious that it probably will be the whole packet, or at least it would be with me. Uh, 
Hello, I love Pint of Science. Thanks, Louise. Pint of Science loves you back. Please keep the comments coming in. Uh, Alex Avery is gone. Oh my God, so cute. Well, thanks, man. I mean, I normally get described as sort of handsome, but cute's a new one. So thanks. Thanks, Alex. I'm taken back. Uh, anyone else? We've had a uh, howdy, howdy, Duncan from Nebworth. Uh, after a long day at the WFH, it's cheesecake and science for me. Well, cheesecake, wow. Uh, kind of jealous. I'd love some cheesecake. It's one of my favorite cakes. Um, and we have had a few more comments. We'll come back to more a little bit later on, but it seems you're all telling us what kind of biscuits you've got. Apparently, there might have been some sound problems at the very start. If there was, we do apologize for that. Um, when it comes to the question and answer rounds, please feel free to ask. If there was a part you missed and you want to know exactly what Brad said, let us know and we'll do our best to kind of fill in the gaps. Anyway, it's time for some half-time science. I'm just going to move my tablet device. Uh, you can probably all tell it's time for some half-time science because I've got my hair up uh, because I am doing it today. Uh, for those who weren't here last week, um, I was challenged last week to do a essentially as many science demos as I can in about the space of five minutes, uh, specifically egg demonstrations. So I'm going to do my best. Um, not going to lie, uh, rather than spending a week practicing all of this, I've decided just to leave it up for chance, just because, well, let's face it, it'll be a lot more entertaining that way. So we're probably going to have some broken eggs. Let me just set the timer up and we'll get started. So got about five minutes. Let's rearrange the camera angle so you can see my workstation a bit better. Perfect. Right. A marks get set. Go. So I'm not really a breakfast person, and there's not really a lot for me to do when other people are having breakfast. But there are some amazing demos you can do with eggs. This is my favorite. Uh, I pretend I have magical powers. You spin the egg, keep it in one spot, spin it, and then use your powers to make it spin again. Come on. Ooh, just like that, give it another spin, stop it, and it will continue to spin. Of course, I'm not a sorcerer, so, to my own disbelief. Um, it is, in fact, uh, a force called inertia. So as the egg spins, when I stop the egg, I'm just stopping the egg shell. All the innards inside continue to spin, which allows it to spin around faster. There's a better way of actually showing this using water, some cardboard, and a tube. Now, this is potentially the downfall of this demonstration. So we've got the cardboard and a tube, and we we'll place the egg right on top, just like that. Now, in theory, as we pull the cardboard away, the egg should actually stay put, because there's nothing acting on it. The egg is at rest. It should stay put for a few seconds. After that, when the cardboard is cleared, of course, the force around will direct it downwards, and we should catch it in the water just like that. Oof, that's like the first time that's worked today. Got a lot of eggs for dinner. Right, moving on. In fact, let's keep this in here. So this is a brand new egg. I bought them today, and as you can see, it sinks. And it sinks because it's, well, heavy. It's heavier than the water inside. Now, some of you might know how to tell the difference between a good egg and a bad egg, and bad eggs tend to float because they're full of gas as they're going off. But if you ever do this, make sure you're using fresh water and not salt water because fresh eggs do also float in salt water. This is just normal water with about oh, like seven fistfuls of salt inside. Uh, do not drink it, obviously. But uh, the salt actually makes the fresh water denser than the egg itself means it floats. Right, let's get those out of the way. Sticking with salt, I have here some more. Now, if you're like me and you're having your hard-boiled egg, but you've actually not got anything to put it in, then you're kind of a bit stuck. So I've always carry a little bit of salt with me, and then what I can do is just pour salt on the top of any container, and then you can balance an egg perfectly upright. He says, as he then takes the straw out of his hair. Oh, so uh, it stayed there for a little bit. Oh, it's cracked. It's cracked. It's cracking under pressure. Whoa. So this is a bit more of the finickety demo. 
uh, choosing my words very carefully there. Uh, and basically, the salt adds more surface area, which should, in theory, allow the egg to stand upright and lean against the salt. And you should be able to blow the salt away and it will stay like that. Normally, eggs like to balance that way, but uh, yeah. Right, so um, I don't know about you, but I've often found that having boiled eggs or hard boiled egg is great because it's a nice source of protein, uh, it's good for you, but you're always stuck with the eggshell. And if you don't have a bin nearby, you're kind of in a sticky situation. So instead, if you do find yourself like that, you can actually just put it in a bottle. Uh, so this is it, we've got a hard boiled egg right there. And uh, all we need is a few matches. Oh, oh, what are we doing for time? Oh, a few matches just like that. And come on. You should see the egg will slowly get sucked in. Or is this one going to work as well? I need a couple more matches. Come on. Gonna get set. Here we go. So as the matches burn off all the oxygen that's inside the bottle, we lower uh, the air pressure inside the bottle, which is actually gonna suck that egg in. What I'll do is I'm gonna leave that to one side and we'll keep going. Um, oh, here's a fun one. So this is a fun little experiment to do at home. Uh, eggs have a very similar chemical composition as tooth enamel. So this is a great way to see what happens to your various uh, well, what happens to your teeth when you have various things? So this is coffee. Uh, so the egg we should see in there starts to stain. Here we have uh, vinegar and uh, nothing really, well, vinegar will actually erode all the calcium that makes up that eggshell. And finally, uh, we expect nothing to happen with water. So if we take another little cool demo, as it's been soaking in vinegar, the shell will all come away and it should also start to bounce. Uh, Oh, no, that's the water one. Whoops. Okay. Um, eventually, that will start to bounce. Another real quick one is what I like to call the unbreak, unbreakable, unbreakable. Uh, take an egg. Now, the way that the egg is... Oh, that's a broken egg. We don't want to use that one, Phil. Uh, so the way the shape of an egg is very important. It allows to distribute pressure evenly. So if I put it in the bag, I should be able to plunge it in my fist. This one's broken as well. Uh, yep, that's not going to work. Right. Oh, this is all this is all going to hell. Right. Last demo. And we'll end with a bang because so far everything's been going so well. We're going to try what I like to call flipping egg. Uh, get our egg, place it in the center of the tray. And we're going to take advantage of centrifugal force. And what we should be able to do, one, two, is spin it all the way around without dropping it. Right. Time, 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 time. Okay, uh, what are we on? Six minute, 20 seconds. Okay, so I was way over. I do apologize for that. Uh, let me know what you thought of that. Uh, as long with any of your best egg puns that you might have. Uh, I probably, yeah, it's still, hmm. Anyway, enough of that. Please, once again, in the comments below, if you want, uh, to let me know what your favorite egg demonstration is or your favorite egg pun. I hope you did enjoy that. But for now, we are actually going to reintroduce our guest speaker, featured speaker of the night. So please welcome back to the feed, Professor Bri uh, Brian Coxix. Sorry, that's Professor Brian Coxix over there in my corner. I just caught him in a glimpse of my eye. I take that back. Please welcome Professor Brad Gibson. Hello, Brad. Hi, Phil. Do yeah, you, uh, Brian, Brian Cox's uh, speaker fee is a lot higher than mine, so don't want to mix it <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, right. So, uh, as I've mentioned before, if you do have any questions, uh, please do comment beneath uh, the live feed that you're watching now, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. But to get us started, I kind of wanted to ask a bit more, Brad, about your engagement work that you do, because... When you sent me your bio, there were so many different accolades, things you've achieved, and the amount of people that you work with. I just wondered if you could actually just take a few minutes to talk a bit more 
to us about the sort of engagement work you do. Yeah, I, uh, you know, when I moved to the University of Hull, that was five years ago, and I, I think up until that point in time, I'd been more or less focused on my research career, grants, doing my teaching, um, maintaining my group. Um, but when I moved to Hull and started the center, uh, I realized that I guess my responsibilities and job description had changed, and there was a degree of res responsibility for I don't know, recruitment and engaging with regional colleges. And so it started with thinking a little bit about recruitment. But what I found as I sort of dipped my toe into the outreach and engagement side of things was that I absolutely loved it, uh, became passionate about it. Uh, and it went beyond more than just, you know, a recruitment tool. And that's, to be blunt, hardly what I use it for at all anymore now. It's engaging with school kids, everything four and five year olds at, at early years foundation through to colleges through to public we do 100 maybe i do maybe 80 90 events myself a year from you know doing homeschooling as i'm doing this week through covid 19 with parents who get in touch with me with their kids to going into schools and colleges running internships for students a lot of the focus is on socioeconomically challenged areas widening participation and diversity as a whole Awesome. Uh, I know that we've done a lot of work together, and actually, it's, it's always it's always great to have you talking on on our shows like this. Uh, Brad is also a veteran of Pine to Science. He's done many talks in the past for us in Hull. Uh, I've got a question here from Gary Hunt. Um, Although there is much talk of wormholes, there is little or no evidence. Do you think they exist, and in what form, and where will they be discovered? <laughs> yeah. Um... They are allowable within the um, you know the mathematical framework that Einstein established. So they are mathematically viable. Um, it's elegant, beautiful mathematics that allows their existence. But as you rightly say, we have absolutely no observational evidence that they exist, and we haven't come up with a observational test that would allow us to prove that they exist. Um, lots of speculation on, you know, everything from you know, watching a film like Interstellar, which again, you know, does have its weak points, but is does have some beautiful maths attached to it as well. Um, you know, I've seen speculation that if they do exist, they would be very transient and unstable. Um, they may be one dimensional rather than two dimensional or three dimensional in some sense, which would limit our ability to actually do anything other than send potentially a signal. So yeah, I think right now it, it's it's in that realm of elegant, glorious mathematics that allows their existence. But as you rightly say, trying to figure out what the observational test that would prove it, that's the, again, another one of these 64,000 pound questions and certainly would be a Nobel prize if someone can figure out a way to, to prove or disprove that definitively. Uh, so we've got another question here. Will that come up? Yep. Uh, is it quite common for astronomers to think that things they don't understand are aliens? Is there a special name or term that people in the field use to refer to things they don't understand? I've been alien. Uh, <laughs> um, I think there are a small subset of, of scientists who do jump on things as um going with the one that's going to get you know like clickbait and what is the the hottest thing so you know putting out a press release saying that this unknown thing might have something to do with aliens is a, a certainly a way to ensure you will get clicks on whatever it is that you are putting out there um it doesn't help us in the scientific community um, whatsoever um so i think you know most of the most of the scientists that, um, you know, we're, we don't dismiss things outright. You know, that's the whole point of the scientific process. If somebody puts forward a good hypothesis that can be tested, then we will do so. Um, but whether, I'm sure I'm sure German has a special name for exactly what you've just described, because the German language is, is beautiful <laughs> and has words for everything. And I'm sure there's a German title for someone who is exactly like that. <laughs> Uh, so a real quick answer for this one, because we're getting a lot of questions coming in, uh, but it's sort of related to that question. So a real quick answer. Uh, do you think we're alone? Whew. Are we alone in the universe? Well, when you finish here, you can go and look at my, my TED Talk on YouTube and watch that, and you probably get my answer to it. I My gut feeling is 
yeah, we probably are in terms of advanced civilizations, if you like. Although I do think that there is life out there, maybe sort of bacterial in form, bacterial in nature, microbial, whatever the case may be. But I guess as time goes by, I become a little bit more skeptical about the advanced civilization side. I think fingers crossed they're out there. I just don't don't feel it anymore. Um, awesome. So we'll actually link uh, at the end of today or first thing tomorrow, we'll tweet your, your um, YouTube video up so people can watch more. Uh, we've had from Philip 3 Hello, another awesome cup of science. Thank you very much. About the black hole shadow picture, why did we see a ring and not the whole sphere? Although it's it was a sphere, we couldn't see the black hole right. Yeah, I, right. I, I, I can sort of I can see what you're saying. Um, the short answer is largely because this is almost certainly a rotating black hole, and so the allowable orbits of the photons that cause these photon circles are different than if you have a static black hole that's not rotating. And so it gets into the gory math, but basically the allowable orbits are basically in the plane, if you like, of the orbit when it's a rotating black hole or a Kerr black hole, which is what it what I say there. But also think about a, a ball or a balloon. If you're if you're looking at it, you know, just holding it up in front of you and looking at it, when you look through the center, you're looking through the thinnest part as well. As you look over to the edge of the balloon as you're, or the ball that you're looking through, you start to see through a thicker part of the skin of the, the ball or the balloon. And so even in the case where you have three dimensions, the part in the center, even though there is some, if you like, some light in front, it's, it's thinner in that sense than when you look to the, to the edges where you're looking through a thicker line of sight. So even if it was 3D, it still would look a little more uh, circular, if you like. But this is partly also driven by the fact that it is a 2D rotating black hole, if you like. So uh, we have, oh, we've got so many questions coming in. It's great. Um, just keep my eye on the time. We've got uh, quite a cool one here uh, from Leslie Cunningham. Um, an update of the research into dark energy. Now, I do remember reading a little bit about dark energy myself, but that was that was a good few years ago. So is there an update on that on that particular area of research? Yeah, the short answer is no. Um, the, the, the slightly less flippant answer is that we have, you know, we fine tune the measurement. Uh, you know, we've got elegant, beautiful experiments that are, you know, get, giving us a very precise picture of how much of the universe is, of its energy density is in mysterious dark energy, how much of it is in sort of stuff like us, normal material, how much of it is dark matter. So experiments have allowed us really to um, definitively prove the existence of dark energy. We've been able to pin down when dark energy started to take over the um, dynamics of the universe and cause it to accelerate. So we pinned down when that has started to happen. Um, but actually pinning down exactly what the essence of that dark energy is, similarly what exactly dark matter is, you know, we're talking between the two of them, 96% of the universe, and we still don't know what either of them are. Um, there are lots of experiments that are ongoing uh, for over the next five to 10 years to try to disentangle the different dark energy models and the different dark matter models. Uh, although I can think back five, 10 years ago when I heard people saying exactly the same thing in five or 10 years from now, all these experiments are gonna lock it down. But what we're finding is that all the different observations prove that all these things are there but there's little systematic differences between all of them and pinning down the observational systematic differences between all these different experiments uh, is proving to be like a whack-a-mole thing, trying to trying to pin down little uncertainties. The result doesn't go away, but the intercomparison of all the different results has made it difficult to pin down what dark energy and dark matter is. That's, that's an amazing image of just physicists playing whack-a-mole with science <laughs> theories. Um, we're going to go into a bit more of a lightning round of questions now, because as I said, you're getting quite a lot. So um, uh, what is your opinion? So Kellyanne Smith asks, what is your opinion on the theoretical white hole? I think I put that in the same category as wormholes. Beautiful, elegant maths. It should be there mathematically, physically, no evidence. Uh, Rose, Rose Thompson asks, once a planet starts forming, is it guaranteed it will carry on forming? No, I think that um, that is a that is a, a really good question. Uh, if there's not enough material, you may end up just being a 
something much smaller than a full-blown planet that's sort of self-gravitating. Um, but also things come along and can bust you apart before you've had a chance to actually uh, to build up. So it depends on the disk that you're sitting in, how lumpy it is, if there are perturbers running around that might ram into you before you've had a chance to fully grow. Uh, otherwise, left to their own devices, yeah, gravity likes to win out. And so those little perturbations form a little planet, which hoovers up more material and grows a bigger one. So if nothing bugs it, it will continue on. Uh, Anthony Hancock is with better techniques do you expect to see lots of planets in all stages of formation uh yeah and i think you'll see um you know a lot of the telescopes that we have now are based around optical light uh, the stuff we see with our eyeballs uh hubble space telescope is mostly an optical and an ultraviolet wavelength machine so it looks at particular energies of photons but if you want to look at those earliest phases of the formation of planets before they start emitting really a whole lot of light you need the infrared and that is what the james webb space telescope the replacement if you like for the hubble space telescope is an infrared machine and so i think the statistics and characterizing pro protoplanetary systems will see a huge upswing once jwst goes up and is able to train its infrared eyes on all of these different systems which we can still do great things on earth like i've shown you some examples but JWST will just take it to the whole next level. Um, and I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. We're going to go with Leah Cox, who has written, well, what do you think about the Starlink satellites that went up recently? Uh, I'm not actually too sure about these. How recent was it? Yeah, well, they've, they've gone up in drips and drabs. Um, they've got, uh, you, you know, you've got a lot of attention over the last few weeks with uh, very Starlink satellites going over. They're kind of cool because you can look up and see them with the naked eye. Uh, the problem is SpaceX has plans to put up something like 40,000 of them, 42,000 of them. Um, and they are going to be an eyesore for astronomical purposes, unless they can figure out to, a way to make them less reflective, which was what the plan was to be, but they got they got it wrong. They're far too reflective. And they, even with only a few hundred or a thousand of them up there, they're already a nuisance for astronomy. If you multiply that by another factor of a thousand, and there's other companies planning to put up, you know, 40,000 of their own, 50,000 of their own. So this, the sky is going to be proliferated with these satellites. So a little bit more care and attention because it's turning into a, a wild west up there right now in terms of satellites. Um, and finally, our, our last question. Um, Quite a long question, but uh, okay. from Duncan Corpse. I might be saying your name wrong there. I do apologize, Duncan. Um, how much of what we are seeing from the space stuff is direct observations? How many is it enhanced or deduced from observations? And how many is just modeling and uh, simulation? So I'm guessing this is more of a question when we actually see images and research from uh, astrophysics sensors, how much of that is pure imagery and how much of that is actually computer generated or deduced from something that's yep. not oh i think uh i think almost every observational image you see has been i don't know, enhanced in some sense um it's rare that you you know put a camera up and take a picture you might use multiple filters you might stretch the image the colors to to show certain things you're not at least manipulating anything you're making use of the data to i guess to make it more aesthetically pleasing to the eye or more scientifically useful um what you do have to be a little bit careful about and i have to be careful about is uh some of the simulations that exist now look almost interchangeable with observations and unless they're labeled closely so one of the things i did talk about was this observation of this these planets in the in, in that are forming right now that we've taken this beautiful imagery with this sphere instrument when you go back to the yeah, European Southern Observatory press release and just look at the full image, which I didn't actually show. When you look at it, I thought it was a simulation. It looks like a simulation. If you didn't put any labels on it, I would have swore up and down, not bet my life on it, but I, I would have put a pretty good bet on it that what I was looking at was a simulation because it just looked too good. But then I read, you know, the footnote and then read the press release and said, no, this is actual observational data. It's rare right now that I can't tell the difference between the two. Uh, but it's happening more regularly now, and I have to read the fine print now. Uh, so most of it is observations that have been 
not manipulated because that sort of has a negative connotation, but have been worked with to try to tease out the most scientific information that you can. Brilliant. Right. Well, we are going to have to leave it there for our questions and answer round. But what we're going to do is actually bring up your uh, Twitter handle. Uh, let me just get rid of that question. So we're actually going to bring up your Twitter handle now. So if anyone wants to ask a question, we've had loads of questions, and I do apologize that we haven't had time to go through all of them. But if you're dying to get the answer to your question, uh, Brad, would you mind if people tweeted you directly? I'm absolutely happy. You tweet me, email me. I can already. I've got messages coming in from LinkedIn. Some of you are sending me messages in LinkedIn. <laughs> I would prefer you didn't do it through LinkedIn, but uh, no, no disrespect to LinkedIn, but just, just DM me on Twitter or email me. Fantastic. We'll, um, we'll tweet up your contact details uh, later tonight, or in fact, we'll do it first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you do have any questions and you're dying for that answer, please do contact uh, Brad directly. Uh, but without further ado, please, well, well, once again, thank you so much, Brad, for being here tonight. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Sorry about the sound quality at the beginning. Appreciate it. See you later, Brad. Right. So that brings us uh, to the end of our show. We have run over a little bit uh, tonight, but but don't worry. Um, I say don't worry as if you were worried beforehand. I'm not worried, so hopefully you aren't worried uh, either. Uh, it's been amazing. We've had loads of people commenting throughout the night, uh, which has been amazing. You all seem to quite like uh, the egg demonstration, so I'm, I'm happy for that. For those of you who might be concerned that I've just wasted a load of eggs, don't worry. I have kept every broken attempt, and it is my dinner tonight. So uh, I've just got to sift through this and get the shell out. But other than that, it is dinner time, so nothing's being wasted. Anyway, as I said, that brings us to the end of our third episode of Cup of Science. Uh, please do join us next week where we've got a special Oceans Day themed talk from Dr. Kath Waller all about Antarctica and whether or not it's actually isolated the way we think it is. Uh, plus, we have got a halftime act from SciCon Extraordinaire or Science Communicator Extraordinaire, Sarah. Uh, oh, I'm going to stop that now. Um, so please do go online. Uh, we'll be tweeting out all the information uh, about next week's show later tomorrow. Um, and we hope to see you then. So thank you again for tuning in. And that's it from us today.